I was told not to give an academic seminar. I'm supposed to give you war stories. <laughs> so just imagine the traffic jams in Bangkok. You can't go anywhere. But Marty and I were invited to get into a royal yellow Mercedes, driven by a chauffeur and escorted by motorcycle cops. And they stopped all the traffic for us to be able to go to the palace where David Nalen and Richard Cash were awarded the Prince Maidol Award. This was 12 years ago. It was a grand, grand occasion and a well-deserved award. Now, I've known uh, David and Richard all my life. They're very, very dear colleagues uh, and also uh, very, very strong friends. Richard really is a member of our family of sorts. And my daughter is here, Alexis. I we were got delayed because <laughs> she couldn't miss um, this occasion. Actually, the first time I met Richard was not in person. We were shown his house in Bangladesh when we arrived at the Kala Research Lab. I was following in the footsteps of John Rohde, who was my mentor and one year ahead of me at Harvard Medical School. John was a hero here, and he went out there, and he escorted Marty and I to Richard's house. And Marty said, this house is awfully dark. What was going on in this house? <laughs> All sorts of rumors about Richard's parties, because he was a bachelor <laughs> in those days. Now, you should know, the Collin Research Lab was an NIH CDC outpost for research, as you heard. And every year, two doctors went out from the NIH, and two doctors went out from the CDC, and all four of us evaded Vietnam, as the Yellow Parade would tell you. I was one year behind John and two years behind Richard, although um, I probably look older than they do now. <laughs> but um, it was a remarkable research uh, atmosphere, and most of the time it was fighting between the NIH appointed supervisors like Kendrick and Ruth Hare, and young Turks like David and Richard who wanted to do their own things, and John Rohde uh, as well. And I also rebelled and did want to do my own research and my own things. But it was a very unusual uh, environment. Of course, uh, Richard and John always took the theme of taking science to the field. Actually, taking was from Harvard Medical School, Building D. I remember as a medical student going there and seeing Stanley Schultz do the chamber work. You know, he had a gut, and he was showing how the transport of glucose would carry a sodium with it, which is what David has explained is the physiological foundation of oral rehydration. And by the way, Stan was also a recipient of the Prince Mario Law in recognition of the applied oral rehydration and the basic research that came out of right out of Harvard uh, Medical School. So Ed and Megan and all of the Harvard Medical School graduates here should know that that was really the foundational research that led to the oral rehydration uh, development. Now, had it not been taken to the field, there would be no ORT as David said, because everything was well treated uh, with intravenous. And in fact, there's a photograph of a patient with 50 bottles, I think it was 100, 100. I'm not sure, 100, <laughs> 100 bottles of IV. But, um, uh, but in Bangladesh, of course, uh, IVs weren't going to work. And so the, the development of our rehydration is one of the other lessons of science. You've got to take the problems and the solutions to where the people are. You can't just sit in Building D. By the way, it's nothing against Building D. But, <laughs> I, when I went out, I didn't know anything about cholera. I never heard the term at Harvard Medical School. Sorry, <laughs> I never, I didn't know. And yet, you should know, there were four pandemics of cholera epidemics that swept into North America and wiped out part of the city of Boston. And indeed, if you look at the mass, the founding and expansion of the Mass General Hospital, a lot of that was due to the cholera epidemics of the 19th century. So it was not that long ago, but we have very short memories. All right, and by the time I went to medical school with John, <laughs> we didn't know anything about, <laughs> about cholera. We did get to meet Richard eventually in person, but actually my wife Marty talks about how she met him, which was uh, one morning when we were in Bethesda, we had been evacuated, we were living in, in Bethesda, I was back at the NIH, and uh, our son Greg, who was not, was not able to be here, but he didn't wake up and cry in the morning, so she said, something's wrong, you know? It's, you know. So she went running out, and of course, uh, she always, she thinks Richard is like God because he was playing with Greg and Greg wasn't waking my wife up. Okay, this was before Alexis was, was born. So she felt that Richard had the special characteristic of being not only close to children but also students and others, an empathy that uh, has obviously carried forward uh, in his life. But the reason we were back was because there was a terrible cyclone, I won't go into it, I was in a lab doing my adenyl cyclist assays and John had his 
Chambers working on flux flows in human gut uh, transport. And uh, our wives came in and said, you know, you're doctors and now we're learning a half million people were killed in a cyclone on the coast. Why don't you go down there and do something? I said, who, me? I don't know what to do. She said, you've been trained as a doctor. I said, yeah, but I was at the MGH and I don't know. I don't know. I'm the rush. But no, she said, get, you know. But we were young. Uh, we were yellow berets. We were out there. And at that time, there were about a dozen Bengalis who had been trained overseas. We became very close personal friends. Most of them had been trained in Britain as part of the colonial <laughs> empire, not in the United States. One of them was a guy named Abed, and he was the uh, treasurer of Pakistan Shell Oil Company, and he had a lovely house in Chittagong next to the disaster, and so he opened this house up for the relief work of volunteers like us. All right? And then eventually, he, um, with the war, he got uh, singled out by the military. He escaped, and then he came back, and he decided to start relief work, and of course, that's the famous foundation of BRAC, the largest NGO in the world today, with 120,000 full-time workers pursuing all sorts of work around the world. And especially, I remember Abed saying, well, you guys invented this oil rehydration, and all you got to do is mix some salt and water with the hands and all that. We should be doing that, and every mother in Bangladesh should do it. I said, no, 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 NGO can't do this. So, of course, he immediately started a national program to do uh, Le Bangor, which is the uh, taking a scoop of, uh, of sugar, molasses, and a pinch of salt and putting it in a half liter of water and mixing it and creating a, uh, and I'll get into the, <laughs> some of the, uh, you get, you, with, with a journey like this, you end up with competition. David was very polite, but there was quite a bit of struggle between the Hopkins group and trying to take credit for the ORT. And David and Richard eventually getting recognized for their contribution, which fortunately was uh, uh, solidified through the publication dates in issues in journals like The Lancet. But there were other kinds of competition. I remember when Brack started the oral rehydration, they didn't want packets because the villagers couldn't afford the packets. The villagers could afford their own hands to scoop the sugar and to pinch the salt. So what did we do? Well, we went to the lab, and we had, you know, 100 women do the Le Bangor mixture, and then we tested the chemical composition, and we published it as a letter to the Lancet. And that was one way that we got Mike Merson of WHO <laughs> to shut up, <laughs> because at that point, WHO wanted to brand the packet as a WHO approved packet. So you get these kinds of competition with Hopkins or WHO on the journey toward discovery and application. Well, let me uh, close by saying that um, uh, I wish the School of Public Health would do a better branding job of Richard and Oral Rehydration. It's been terrible, by the way. Uh, I, although I have to say, when you were Dean Barry, I think you were the first team to actually pick up on this. But I'm tired, as a medical school graduate, I constantly get flyers to donate money, and I see photos of Paul Farmer, and I'm a great admirer of both Paul and Jim Kim. But I actually think Richard's contributions are at least as great as Paul and Jim Kim. And it's under-recognized, and this is one of my points here, okay? It is under-recognized, okay? And if you think about the Harvard School of Public Health, which about, I know a little bit about, the famous production of the school has been in technology, Tom Willard with the polio uh, vaccine, okay? The famous graduates are Bill Fege and Grope Brundlin, probably, okay? But I think Richard's oral rehydration work deserves to be in that level of productivity of the Harvard School of Public Health that should be publicized, and you can raise an ooh amount of money with this, but it's just not, it's just not, not happening. I mentioned that, the, you know, Richard, um, uh, oral rehydration is a teaching technology. It is behavioral because a mother has to learn what to do. And one of Richard's unusual qualities, uh, he's a superb teacher. You know, he is perhaps the best teacher of the Harvard School of Public Health. All right? If you go as I do with him around the world, you'll see all the graduates of the Harvard School of Public Health, whether they're foreign or American, run up to Richard. Okay, because they admire and they, they, they received his teaching, and it's not just teaching. He has the empathy 
of the students. They, they feel that he understands them, and he actually uh, nurtures the students in his, in, his usual, in his unusual way. So I think, I think, I think, by the way, this school is very bad at recognizing good teaching, which Richard is really the best at. And it's, it's, a really, it's a really shame, and I should tell you, he shared this gift with other schools. He's helped create two schools of public health. One is in Kerala at the Achermenon School of Public Health. Probably most of you don't know this. And the other, of course, is the Brack School of Public Health that he and John Rohde created. that has been running now. It's the first and only field-based uh, school of public health in the world. And it's turning out great graduates who are performing great services right now. And nobody at Harvard, by the way, at the Harvard School of Public Health knows this. That's the thing that shocked me. Okay, so sorry to be uh, so parochial about this, but <laughs> I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak. I feel like a privileged uh, colleague of Richard and David's. I feel especially a uh, special friendship to them as a member of the Yellow Parade, and I know that Richard is a, a member of our family. And finally, I want to thank Richard for allowing me all those mulligans on the golf course. <laughs> You are hearing from and seeing people who were at the beginning of one of the, if not the most cost-effective life-saving intervention imaginable. And I think Lincoln is absolutely right. It has been just amazingly difficult. Diarrhea is not the most popular disease. It's not like AIDS. So doing things in diarrhea doesn't always get you five gold stars. Um, and I have tried in my humble way to explain the contribution of Richard and David. And the best I've been able to say that seems to resonate within the Boston community is they've saved more lives than the entire Massachusetts General Hospital since its beginning. And that is another. We have a terrific panel, and I would hope that we could keep the discussion uh, uh, a real discussion and get lots of comments and questions, because you don't get to see these guys, these incredible people, uh, very often. And it's a very special occasion uh, to get some insights into uh, how this came about and how it has influenced other aspects of work at Harvard and in the world. And particularly to David and Richard for bringing us here together, uh, reunion of the Yellow Berets. Um, but I wanted to talk about where we went from there. Uh, there were many, many wonderful times in Dhaka, uh, and still are, uh, for those of us that go back regularly. But I had the good privilege of working with Jim Grant as his major advisor uh, for health in UNICEF. Jim is some of you know, but not all of you. Jim, the executive director of UNICEF for 15 years until he died in 1995, um, was probably the most dynamic leader of an international agency that was concerned about health. And I wrote a paper, uh, which I shared with him, called uh, Who Dies of What and Why? We said there were five million deaths a year from diarrhea. Secondly, we have a technology that works remarkably, and it's affordable and can be understood by anybody of how to use it. So we've seen that the, the, the advances that um, happened could not have happened without, as, as has been said, without Richard and David and others being embedded in, in the countries that, that had these kinds of problems. So I, I think you know, not only would I like to see that uh, the change at, at Harvard's level, but I want to point out that you know, one way to embed people is to train the people who live in those countries, something that got brought up earlier. And I think we have a, a deep responsibility to develop the capacity so that who, the people who are embedded are actually the physicians and researchers who, who, who live in those countries. So lastly, Richard writes that um, ORT remains underused uh, in some critically affected countries, including um, in high income countries. And I, I was really curious to think about what the resistance to, um, to and you brought this up too, but. So I, I wrote a number of things. Um, people to point out that doctors don't like to lose authority or reimbursement um, by uh, transferring responsibility for caring for, for providing uh, rehydration to anyone who can cook rice. 
Uh, and I and that's the sort of thing we all understand. Um, one critique that I really, really was a little bit shocked by, and I, I just want to end with, is the idea that somehow o ORT does not solve the problem, the, the, the underlying problem of sanitation and poverty. Well, of, of course it doesn't. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I try to think the, the analogy would be to say, would we ever forego providing chemotherapy to cancer patients because we have not yet solved the problems of, of the environmental exposures that lead to cancer? No, of course not. Um, we can provide the best possible care to people, which is ORT, and address the social injustices that lead to these kinds of problems at the same time. And that's something that Richard has done and for which I'm extremely grateful and, and proud to be a, a member of this organization. Thank you.